All right, we're going to bring everybody in. Everybody's up on the screen, and we can go deeper and take some of your questions, which have been coming in. John, let me just start with you to follow up on one of your uh, later points. Uh, I mean, you're very, very focused and 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 candid. We should not be intimidated by this nuclear threat today. Um, that means, uh, you know, don't back down. But are you talking about something else? Like, a, a, can you think? Is there a, a more specific? response to uh, him for the second time saying the word nuclear? Well, he said it actually a whole bunch of times. And in fact, it's, it's worth understanding why. Uh, the Soviet Union had dominance in conventional weapons, especially in Europe, which was the main theater. Today, the United States, and of course, NATO makes this even more true, have a vast superiority to Russia conventionally. That's why in Russian defense doctrine, the, when, uh, this has been described by Westerners as a policy of escalate to de-escalate. They threaten nuclear because they understand their weakness conventionally. As for the current situation, um, yes, we, we simply don't back down. I mean, I am not a defense guy, uh, but I understand the importance of power to diplomacy. And uh, I mean, I've, I've suggested to people who know more about this than I do, is this a time to consider DEFCON 3? There are four defensive statuses for U.S. forces. The normal one is the lowest one, DEFCON 4. Going to DEFCON 3 would be a way of saying to Putin, you ain't going to intimidate us with your wild threats. It also, and this is very important, it's a signal to Shoigu, the defense minister, Gerasimov, and others in the Russian elite that um, you know, we're, not, we're not to be messed with. And that gives reason to them to consider ways to rein in their boss. Well, one, one more point here. If Putin fails in Ukraine, and I'm pretty sure he will, uh, his future in Russia is, is the question. Yeah, we're gonna have, we have a bunch of questions about that, that idea. I wanna get to that. Yeah. I mean, if we went to DEFCON 3, I wasn't even aware that's a real thing. It's in all the movies. But uh, stakes get high for mistakes, misunderstandings. DEFCON, there's, there's DEFCON 3, there's DEFCON 2, and there's DEFCON 1. I'm old enough to remember, although I was just a graduate student, us going to DEFCON 3 during the, during the Yom Kippur War. Mm. It's just a caution to the Kremlin that says, we have nukes too. Because and some people just say, they sort of go like this when, when they hear that sort of suggestion. Um, if we don't understand that we, that, you know, we, we have nukes too, Putin can intimidate us into giving up serious interests of ours. The same game he's playing right now with Ukraine, he could play with the Baltics or with Poland or with Romania. Okay, thanks. Dr. Schwartzer, Daniela, um, we have a question from um, Kate Hotchkiss-Taylor in North Haven, Maine. She asks, what are your thoughts on China possibly looking at all this in Ukraine and um, processing it as information that could help form a strategy toward an invasion by the Chinese of Taiwan? That's indeed a very important question, and I'm pretty sure China watches extremely closely, uh, not only what Russia is doing, but also how Europeans and Americans react. And that is why I'm so convinced that this very aligned approach um, in terms of um, first of all, the U.S. disclosing intelligence and, you know, coordinating very closely with Europeans before Russia invaded Ukraine. And then the move uh, of the transatlantic partners to impose several packages on, of sanctions on, on Russia are of key importance. Then the support to Ukraine. And by the day, we hear more of that, more that is coming in. And I think this, this last point that John just mentioned, the question, how should the US react to um, the, you know, the very recent escalation of Putin, um, of putting his uh, you know, deterrence on a higher alert level? I think we, we need to really make sure that also in that the messages are coordinated between the NATO partners and then those Europeans who are not part of NATO. I think this is of the essence. And we have to do everything we can uh, to support Ukraine um, for the sake of, of freedom and democracy in the country, for its own sovereignty and autonomy, but also for what is happening in Europe more generally. 
And that will be read as a very important indicator by China to what extent the states stand together and what the price might be if China violates the same principles that Russia has just violated in Ukraine, uh, if it attacks Taiwan, whichever way, even if it's a cyber or, or hybrid attack, um, we don't necessarily need to take into account a full military invasion as we are now seeing in Ukraine. But I think it is very important that the political West continues to send messages that it um, is there to defend principles. And one of the very important principles of the international order is uh, national sovereignty and uh, the control over its own territory. And yeah, I think China will look at that very closely, how Europe continues and the US continue to react. Ambassador Vimont, Pierre, I um, have a more specific question that a, that a viewer has to, to pose to you in just a moment, but I want to give you a, an opportunity to react to this part of the discussion or the news since you spoke about uh, Putin mentioning the nuclear uh, capability of Russia another time and also Zelensky's agreement to talks. The, um, on the nuclear alert, um it's one step further, but as uh, Ambassador Herbst was saying a few minutes ago, we've had already um, statements by the Russian leader uh, moving in that direction. We even had some answers, at least from what I know, on the, on the French side by the French Foreign Affairs Minister, saying that the uh, NATO alliance was also about uh, being able um, to, to use uh, nuclear uh, deterrence. So I think we should not be intimidated, as, uh, as the ambassador rightly said. Um, but the risk there, as Daniela was also saying, is the risk of uh, miscalculation from one side or the other. And the one thing I, I'm really concerned about is that all those channels of the, the confliction um, uh, that had existed in the past for the time being seems to be, uh, seem to be gone. Uh, the possibility for the um, chief heads of uh, defense to talk to each other uh, and, and, and avoid uh, here again, misperception and uh, and the wrong move at the end of the day. So one has to be very cautious there and try to keep by aware or another some channels of communication open precisely to avoid the uh, very dangerous move that would lead us to a very difficult um, uh, situation. The, the second point I would like to, uh, to raise is um, how do all these um, officials around Putin uh, can talk to him and bring him back from, um, uh, from, from the brink? Um, um, this is where I have doubts. We are in a very difficult situation now where it seems that we have a very lonely authoritarian leader uh, moving ahead all, uh, on his own. Um, and uh, this has to be taken into account also. How do we deal with authoritarian leaders? How do we tackle that uh, reality, political reality that is there? Um, Emmanuel Macron has tried in, in recent days um, to convince Putin from, from moving ahead. And we've seen the result, unfortunately, but it's there for all to see. Um, so that is a major problem. And that brings me to your question about uh, um, the last move by, uh, by President Zelensky to, um, uh, to go into these talks. Of course, he's going there in a very difficult position, even if he has the support of all Western leaders and the NATO, he is still on the ground in a very difficult position. So these kind of negotiation, as we have seen in history, are very difficult ones. Um, there are ones where you're under pressure. It looks like a blackmail, a blackmailing situation. Um, and that is not an easy diplomatic position uh, to stand up and resist. We have to take that into account too. Pierre was just worried, uh, John, about uh, lack of channels of communication directly with Russian, the Russian military hierarchy. You said that still, we might be able, our generals could talk to their generals. During this uh, particular intense phase, uh, do you think communications are more circumscribed? Um, I know that Millie has regular contact. Uh, Millie is the head of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has regular contact with his Russian counterpart, Gerasimov. 
Uh, and uh, so I think, I think it would be a very good idea if he were to call him literally like right now and just take his temperature. As I said, you look at that picture uh, and it's amazing how criminological analysis is very important even today, an old Soviet um, expertise. Uh, and there's no reason why Austin could not do the same with Shoigu, the Russian defense minister. But that's very important. Uh, you know, it, it's, worth, it's worth noting that despite the difficult relations between Washington and Moscow over the past, say, um, 10 or 12 years, um, there have been, uh, I won't say many, but regular efforts on the U.S. side to reestablish channels to deconflict the possibility of a confrontation or a shooting confrontation between U.S. and NATO ships and planes on the one side and their Russian counterparts. And the Russians have always turned this down. And again, if you follow this closely, you know that uh, Russian pilots and Russian uh, ship commanders have at times done very, very provocative things in approaching NATO and U.S. warships and warplanes. Um, Ambassador Vimont, uh, Jim Nelson of Camden, Maine's got a blunt, short question. Can, should Russia be removed from the U.N. Security Council? Uh, I've... Uh... I've heard this uh, proposition put forward by President Zelensky. I think it was yesterday or two days ago. Um, first of all, I'm not sure we could manage to do that because of China and, and even maybe other uh, UN uh, Security Council members at the time. Think about uh, how India so far has um, has positioned itself in this crisis. It has also abstained at the, uh, the vote on the UN Security Council resolution to uh, one day ago, two days ago now. Um, so I think um, one could uh, try, but I don't think it will go, uh, I don't think it will go very far, and, and, and unfortunately. So no, I think we have to live up with reality is that, um, we're facing a, a, a major actor in the international field, which is not playing anymore by the rules. And we have to find the proper ways to reconnect with that actor. Um, as uh, Ambassador Herbst said, very rightly so in my opinion, it's by showing a position of strength, first of all. Uh, but once we have done that, it will be how to uh, reconnect and, and find ways of, uh, of uh, working diplomatically. And I think, honestly, for the time being, we have to admit there is no clear path for that for the time being. For the time being, what is going to uh, rule the game, I would say, it's what's happening on the ground, mostly in Ukraine in the next, uh, in the next 48 or 72 hours. And the um, decision that will come out of what is happening on the ground. I think this is really what's important. It's important to keep the UN Security uh, Council active. It's important to go to the General Assembly. It's important to keep uh, possible channels open. But what will make the difference at the end of the day is the situation on the ground for the time being. And we have to accept that. Yesterday, we had a... Um... Russia-based commentator, critic of Putin, um, an, uh, a scholar and a journalist, um, sounding, putting significant stock in the notion that Putin's plans have been, have bogged down, at least temporarily, and that this invasion did not go as swiftly as he wanted. And now, since his presentation, more troops have gone in. Um, you know, my question to him, which he couldn't fully answer, but I think it's a question for us is, does it matter if much really in the grand scheme of things, if there's more resistance in Ukraine than um, the Russians had anticipated? It, it does this, could it possibly add up to, um, to something of significance? Um, if you're asking me the question, yes, it could have some significance if, um, if it lasts, if resistance lasts, and if, um, as uh, your interlocutor was saying yesterday, uh, the Russian army is bogged down. I'm not so sure it's the case yet. Um, and this is what is so um, uh, worrisome uh, to some extent, is that 
if the uh, if the Russian forces upgrade uh, their aggress- uh, aggressivity, I would say, and uh, hit more and more with more and more civilian casualties all over the country. Um, this is going for the worse, of course. And I think this is why precisely President Zelensky, who is very much aware of that, is uh, accepting to go into these negotiations, is that the... Um, uh, the uh, the end game of this kind of uh, ongoing battle uh, in in Ukraine could be disastrous for the whole country, of course. Um, Virginia from the University of Maine uh, makes this point in the form of a question. President Trump was impeached for the first time by the House of Representatives for withholding defense funding from Ukraine. Uh, what message did that send to Vladimir Putin and how do we see it playing out today? Do you think the previous administration's different posture uh, when it comes to this issue um, is still reverberating? John, you could start. Uh, I don't think, well, if, if the Russians were analyzing our political system correctly, they would have seen the whole incident with Trump as evidence of strong bipartisan support in Congress for Ukraine. Um, Trump had to back down from that nasty play, not just because it was exposed, but because he was hearing from Mitch McConnell, Rob Johnson, Lindsey Graham, prominent senators, you don't do that. So he stepped back. Uh, I don't think it has more repercussions than that. I mean, I think in, in terms of this crisis, I think that's ancient history. Thank you. Uh, Daniela, uh, John mentioned it, that there was this one other thing of breaking news over the last 24 hours. I mean, there's many things, but he highlighted the Germany's new commitment to spending more than 2% of GDP on defense, um, you know, from your position where you are now in Germany. How big a deal is that? I think it's a huge deal and it's a real, you know, a, t- a turn in German foreign security and defense policy that we saw happening actually this morning. Uh, The German Chancellor spoke to open a special parliamentary session on the situation in Ukraine and Russia's aggression. Um, They devoted uh, several hours to the debate and it was a very thorough and very, very engaged debate which um, gave a lot of support to Ukraine. Already the ovations uh, when the Ukrainian ambassador was greeted right at the start of the session, he was there present. Um, were were very, very long and enormous. And I think that was uh, beyond all de facto announcements, and I'll come to them in a moment, was of huge political importance to show this. Because Germany in the past weeks, um, you know, raised some doubts with Ukrainians, with European partners, and also across the Atlantic, to what extent it is a reliable player in the standoff with Russia. Now, what happened last night was a first important step. That was that the government, first of all, agreed to uh, excluding Russia from uh, the SWIFT system. Um, Germany and Italy were the last ones to to agree. Um, And so a position yesterday afternoon could be taken by the whole EU. And then in the evening, um, the government cleared arms deliveries, defensive arms deliveries to Ukraine. Um, They had to overcome certain legal hurdles that we have in Germany because, because of our history we have extremely constrained arms export rules. And one of the things that Germany actually can't do is to export arms into conflict zones. And Ukraine obviously is a conflict zone. So they had to find a way to to make this legally acceptable and politically acceptable. And here I come to the parliamentary debate we had this morning um, or we saw this morning. Now, it was really, really uh, clear that the chancellor made a historical speech there. He made it very clear that the conflict is not about Ukraine only. It is about uh, democracy and freedom. It is about Europe. Um, And he said at one point that the Ukrainian government and the president with his resistance stands on the right side of history and that Germany wants to stand there with him. And so I found, you know, that's just one quote, but um, the whole the whole position he took and the enormous amount of applause he got throughout the speech by Parliament showed that this is a very very broadly shared view in Germany. He made concrete proposals in I would say two buckets are most important. One is the defense bucket. 
he uh, said that Germany would meet finally uh, the two percent targets um, that NATO agreed to uh, years ago, um, and the German government at the time committed to it. But the defense expenditure over the years was never um, augmented quickly enough to actually reach those two percent of GDP. There's now a very clear commitment. He said they would create an extra defense investment fund of 10 billion euros because Germany lags behind on a number of really important projects. Uh, he mentioned cyber, um, he mentioned uh, armed drones and other things that Germany has to invest in to keep its military modern um, and actually able to, to act. And so I think the commitment to defense was very clear. He also said that he would appreciate if Parliament could give this a constitutional base. So that's really a huge change. Uh, needs a two-third majority in the Bundestag, but not impossible in current political circumstances. The second bucket I wish to mention is energy. And this is so important because Germany was constrained in many ways due to its energy reliance, the import reliance on natural gas from Russia. So some of the caution that it had over the years, and its whole strategy was basically based on uh, closer energy ties with Russia, with Nord Stream 2, this pipeline supposed to just be opened. So the whole bet was made on Russia plus renewables, but that takes more time. We left nuclear. And so um, what he said uh, during that parliamentary speech is that it is a very clear goal of the German government to reduce uh, the reliance on gas imports from Russia. He made very two very concrete announcements, the opening of two LNG terminals in Northern Germany, um, important also for potentially transatlantic relations because this is something we could import also from the US. Um, and he said very clearly that this answer to the Russian threat also in the area of energy has to be a European one. All in all, he made a very strong commitment to NATO, a very strong commitment to the European Union and went as far as saying that really um, we are in a historical moment where democracy and freedom are challenged to such an extent that Europe has to stand together more closely and NATO has to stand together more closely. And so I really think we saw a change in foreign policy, security and defense happening this morning. I have a bunch of questions. I'll try to distill it to one because they're on a similar topic. I think it's partly informed by uh, part of the conference yesterday where um, we were rehearsing during this conference some bad scenarios where NATO could be drawn in to, um, you know, kinetic action uh, in this thing. Like, for instance, there was one scenario. Imagine multiple millions of refugees headed toward Poland. Let's say Russia did something bad to threaten that flow of refugees. Let's say we put up a no-fly zone. And then that led to a flashpoint if a plane was knocked from the sky. So a lot of questions in that, uh, in that vein. Uh, Ron Bancroft from Cumberland, Maine, which is down near Portland. What if Poland were drawn into the conflict with Russia in the fog of war, he writes. How would NATO-Russia conflict play out? Are we, are, we, are we ready for that? The former ambassador to NATO from the US thought that we were. What does the panel think? You want to start, John? Uh, I think that the Biden team has been, you know, uh, clearly looking at all contingencies. And I think that one would also be included. Uh, my sense watching them is that they are really shy about anything that might lead to an actual confrontation between us and, and Russia. And we saw that, for example, back last spring when we decided not to send a destroyer into the Black Sea as the Russians massed all those forces on the border uh, with Ukraine. And the Brits did wind up, to their credit, sending their destroyer into the Black Sea. We saw it, on, on, I, I say this in sadness, uh, just three weeks ago, as this crisis really began to build to where we are now, when we said that not only should all American citizens leave Ukraine now or then, but we would not evacuate them in a military operation. We do that sort of thing, I won't say all the time, but fairly regularly. Our military is very good at it. And we did it, uh, we delivered humanitarian aid to Georgia with our ships and our warplanes during the 2008 war. So I think, I think that, that was also a sign of weakness, which is unfortunate in, the, in these circumstances. So I think the administration's first instincts would not be the best, 
But uh, I believe that if a crisis of the type you described were to build, they would be um, compelled, at least by political pressure, to do the right thing. Pierre, uh, Ambassador Vimon, what about, like, what's your level of anxiety at this, uh, at this moment about this starting to touch NATO territory more directly? Um, a high level uh, of anxiety, I would say, uh, because once again, um, looking back at what uh, President Putin said uh, last Monday in his speech, this is um, a sort of Pandora box that has opened there. Um, his, um, his, his own narrative about European history is so different from ours uh, that you see no limit to that at the end of the day. And therefore, I wouldn't be surprised that he could be trying to test NATO's resilience uh, one step further. Uh, um, uh, and therefore, some of the, um, some of the contingencies uh, that you have been uh, just mentioning uh, right at the moment are certainly there. Uh, look at migration. Um, this, as we speak, the Home Affairs Ministers of the European Union are meeting precisely to coordinate the work that can be done by all 27 member states in order not to leave all this right on the, sh the whole burden on the, uh, on the shoulders of, of, of Poland. Uh, and I have no doubt there will be solidarity there, contrary to what we have seen in the past. On this, I am, I'm rather confident that Europe will respond in, in, in the proper way. Um, but it requires precisely um, um, a real effort, a strong unity, uh, cohesion among all of us. And I think this is what we've got at the moment. And now, as we face um, a, a, a Russian leader that may be ready to go uh, as far as, as possible, we need to be ready uh, also and have all the necessary contingency plans um, to, uh, to respond to that. And this is exactly where we are. So, um, uh, you know, prepare for the worst and hope that this will never happen. I think this is where we are at the moment in Europe. Yesterday, the journalist scholar in, um, in Moscow um, sketched out his vision that Vladimir Putin, had he not taken this action in Ukraine, could have spent a long time in office as he set himself up constitutionally now to do. He could have just sat there for decades. Um, things were going his way, was his view. But that in, his, in the view of this commentator yesterday, that this um, move on Ukraine is, at least in the medium to longer term, bound to fail, and that he sped up history, that, 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 he, that what he's done means he will not be in office as long as had uh, he not done this. Um, but you could imagine some people here in the conference, the world at large, starting to think that there could be regime change in Moscow sometime soon. And I, I think I just want to get your sense of this. That's not what we're talking about. Not nothing imminent just because there are significant protests within Russia about this military action. What do you think? Um. Let's be honest, it's very difficult to predict uh, Russian politics. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's, uh, it can be surprising, but look at the um, uh, very um, brave uh, protest in the last few days by something like 3,000 mm -hmm. Russian citizens, um, how this has been uh, stopped uh, very quickly by police. So I don't think we are there yet. Uh, but one thing for sure um, is, in my opinion, if you look at the broad picture, um, um, Putin is facing exactly the same challenge as um, most of European nations have been facing for many years, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the 20th century, which was, was uh, I would say, the end of empires. Uh, France has gone through that. Uh, Britain has done the same, Germany and, and a few others. 
how to adapt to a new reality is that your empire, empires are gone. And for the Europeans, this has been how we have started the whole integration process of the European Union. We decided to do this in a peaceful way. Uh, Putin is still facing and struggling with this challenge. Um, he hasn't accepted the end of the Soviet Union. He may not even have accepted uh, the change in the Russian Empire at the end of the 19th century, because this is where he was going back in his speech. So he's facing that challenge. And I personally think he has made a complete um, miscalculation with the way he has decided to answer that huge issue and that great historical question. Um, um, how will this unfold in the next few days, in the next few weeks? I don't know. We're in, we're in, in a very uncertain ground now, and we all know that. Uh, but I think this is the challenge he's facing uh, now. Any final thoughts before we wrap up this section on that point or anything else? All right.